Okay, uh, it's uh, 11, so uh, let's get started. And good morning or good afternoon, depends on, <laughs> depending on where you are located. Um, this is the, uh, um, the panel uh, discussion for DCMI Virtual 2020. And uh, today we have three speakers and uh, the, you know, the whole uh, session will, um, we have speakers from, as you see from the screen, uh, OCLC um, research, that's technical research uh, division, and uh, uh, also a librarian from uh, Yale Lib University Library. And uh, we have uh, a, uh, uh, a faculty from an iSchool. So three speakers, and we are uh, coming here today to discuss deep semantic representation uh, from metadata descriptions. So it's, uh, we have a focus on linked data and which is kind of popular topic today. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, uh, introduce the first, um, I think uh, probably the best way is to have the speakers introduce themselves because um, they know, uh, you know, they know themselves better than I do. And so uh, our first, well, before I go on, um, I just want to mention that uh, we'll have all three presentations uh, done uh, all together, one after another, until the end. Um, we'll have the question answering um, time. So we'll leave uh, ample time for uh, users to ask questions. So if you have the question, you know, during the presentation, you're welcome to post your questions in the chat room and I will keep an eye on the uh, questions in the chat room. And at the end, we'll go through the, uh, the questions in the chat room. And also, if we still have time, well, we'll have a free um, question answer uh, uh, session. So, um, Andrew, uh, I will, uh, you know, please go ahead. Thank you, um, and thank you for coming, everyone, today. And thank you to my to our moderator and to our co my co panelists for letting me share this ninety minutes with them. Um, just real quickly about myself, uh, I work in OCLC research. Uh, I manage a team of architects, engineers, and data scientists, uh, and I'll be talking uh, a lot about their their work. I have a lot of ground to cover, uh, so here's an agenda for your review. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, what linked data is, as those resources for getting started with linked data are quite numerous and have been addressed by others uh, even in this conference. Uh, and of course, as ever at OCLC, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, so I want to acknowledge some of them here. Uh, this will also serve as my excuse at the end of the presentation. If there are questions I cannot answer, I'll defer to those colleagues and, and get back to you uh, if that is the case. So one way uh, to look at linked data is through its technical definition, uh, a set of best practices for publishing data on the web that is interlinked with other data on the web to allow for more useful semantic queries. But for many, that's either incomprehensible in one extreme or superficial in another. Um, so another way to look at this is through the question, why linked data? Uh, and the answer to that question is because it helps connect data and through this process, you can connect isolated systems and services, which allows them to better connect people to libraries and libraries to each other. And I hope to be able to give you a couple of examples of that. OCLC has been in this game for a very long time, over a decade. Uh, and over that time, we've learned a great deal about what is needed to do linked data at scale. I'm not going to review the entire history here. I'll give a quick flyover, uh, but there's a link at the top of the screen you can follow. And I'll be putting all of the links mentioned in this presentation in the chat after my presentation uh, for your reference. So we started, uh, like I said, over a decade ago with VOF and FAST and, and actually also WorldCat publishing linked data on the web uh, with the UI, API, and downloadable da data sets. We moved from there to a project called EntityJS, where we explored how linked data maximizes the discovery potential for sets of related entities. Uh, those were related by an event or a literature domain, for example. 
our next project was called the Person Entity Lookup Pilot. This tested the use cases of a client interoperability. So how could we actually link the data uh, across the web and run it as a web service? From there, we started looking at special collections and evaluating tools that would help institutions take control of the linked data creation workflow uh, using a refinery uh, prototype. And then we did a big project a couple of years ago called Project Passage. This was an attempt to build a complete system uh, based on linked data to see how workflows would change and how libraries would manage a uh, paradigm shift from record-based to entity-based uh, metadata management. But I want to spend, instead of a, a full 10-year review, I'd like to focus on current events uh, and drill down on these two projects and how they relate to each other. The first is a production plan for shared entity infrastructure. The other, an ongoing research project, the findings of which will be published very soon. So let me sh start first with our shared entity management infrastructure. Last January, you may have heard, just before everything went a little crazy around the world, OCLC was awarded a Mellon grant, matched one for one uh, with OCLC resources to develop a shared infrastructure for linked data with a focus on creative work and person names. As my boss, Lorcan Dempsey, was quoted in the release, this is a critical step uh, for advancement of many linked data efforts. People need reliable and persistent identifiers, uh, and this is the infrastructure that will advance the entire field of work uh, related to linked data. The goals were largely furnished by the library community itself and built upon what we learned as part of research in the project passage, which I, meant, which I will mention in more detail later. We want to meet libraries' needs, operate at scale and build a sustainable service, and also complement a myriad of efforts that are happening in libraries and in knowledge work more generally. For example, with the linked data for libraries project, PCC, TCMI, whomever it might be. It's a 24 month project in six month increments. Uh, it'll start with a local wiki based implementation with several work streams such as architecture, user experience, data quality. And of course, we've identified uh, further research that's needed uh, uh, beyond the project and during the project itself. At some point, you won't be able to avoid the communication channels as we want the effort to be widely understood and shared, uh, but we're keeping in close contact with other projects like the PCC and LD for, for production. Uh, and we also have regular meetings with an entity management advisory group uh, made up of several libraries. As you can see here, uh, 25 different institutions including public, academic, and research and national libraries are now part of our advisory group and will continue to stay in close touch and communication uh, with additional linked data organizations, as I mentioned, LD4P, PCC, and others to ensure that the infrastructure we're building, we're building is meeting the needs uh, of the community. Our first increment was recently completed with some basic functionality, API and UI, uh, and then of course, establishing some process procedure and cadence for a, a large team of OCLC staff uh, that are working together. Uh, our finding so far is that we made a good choice in our focus on looking at creative work and persons. Um, internal communication amongst the teams and with our library partners, especially in these times, takes a little bit extra effort than we were anticipating. Uh, and of course, scaling has presented some challenges. As many of you know, Wikibase was an organically grown infrastructure, uh, whereas uh, we're starting here with not only very large data sets, but also a well-established community of practice uh, within libraries. Uh, so we've, we've tried, we've faced some, some challenges with some of those scaling issues, uh, and thankfully I can report uh, that we've been able to meet most of them and overcome any of the challenges that we've encountered. Now I'd like to tr transition a little bit to more about linked data for distinctive collections. Um, most folks have a handle on works and persons, uh, but we, uh, we, ex we, we saw in the passage project that distinctive collections present uh, some of their own unique challenges. It's hard to talk about this without the context of what we learned from Project Passage. So I am gonna give just a few slides about that project as well. By 2017 in our, in our research efforts, we were in a position where we had studied the various components of doing linked data at scale. 
creation, publication, and use, but we had not yet looked at the problem of holistically uh, determine how all of these components could be combined to allow for linked data curation. Project Passage invited librarians from 16 institutions to use a wiki-based sandbox to evaluate how users could effectively create, edit, publish, and use linked data for authority metadata, all within a single unified system, without requiring any knowledge of the technical machinery of linked data. The use cases included prototype participants creating metadata for resources in various formats and languages, using the wiki-based editing interface, and later some custom interfaces built by OCLC. It would take many slides to do this project justice, so instead I would urge you to take a close look at the accompanying report written by both OCLC staff and several of the library, library participants, who, and it was published in uh, 2018. But it is worth a little of time uh, to quickly look at some of the key findings. First, we discovered that Wikibase can be used to create structured data with a precision that exceeds our current library standards. The platform enabled user-driven ontology design, uh, but of course it required some more attention to how we're building these ontologies. The, the platform, once supplemented by OCLC's enhancements and standalone utilities, enabled librarians to see the results of their efforts in a discovery interface without having to leave the metadata creation workflow. That was an important finding from our, from our users. Those robust tools are required for local data management. Um, the the Wikibase custom uh, out-of-the-box interface was good, but we found that we needed to create some custom interfaces as well. To populate knowledge graphs with library metadata, uh, those tools need to facilitate the import and enhancement of data created elsewhere. Uh, and the pilot underscored the need for interoperability between data sources, uh, both for ingest and export, which is something that OCLC obviously cares quite deeply about. Uh, and then lastly, and this was an important one, was that the distinction between traditional authority and bibliographic data can potentially disappear in linked data description. So moving to the content DMD linked data pilot, which started shortly after Project Passage, um, this experiment started by looking back at the refinery project and applying the lessons learned from Project Passage and evaluating how these principles could apply to cultural heritage material. We wanted to also prototype some applications that would allow the con conversion of existing record-based metadata to URIs and to manage and publish the resulting entities and relationships. This started with a process of mass aggregation to get a better view of a much more heterogeneous data set uh, that we were talking about with special collections. The initial part of the project ran from January to May of 2019. And I should note that the data in this prototype linked below has not been updated since that time. We used the IIIF Change Discovery API used to harvest about 13 million objects from our hosted content DM collections or about 20 million images. I hope that a lot of you were able to see Glenn Robeson's uh, presentation on IIIF yesterday. If you didn't, uh, I would encourage you to do so. It's one of the best, most thorough explanations and descriptions all in one place that I've ever seen. So you should definitely check it out. We then attempted to uh, linkify the data with URIs that was coming from these heterogeneous collections. And the metadata for those items was reconciled against FAST, and the, which is the faceted application of subject terms, and BIOF, the virtual international authority file, as well as Wikidata. It showed a large set of diverse materials that had their very heterogeneous metadata mapped to Dublin Core and enhanced where possible to build a prototype application. Here's an example, a search for Louis Armstrong, or if you're a jazz purist like my son, uh, Louis Armstrong, retrieves about 500 items. And those facets were created, facets on the left-hand side were created from the reconciliation that was done as the data was imported. The specific image was driven by the IIIF image viewer, uh, Mirador, creating a uniform, uniform user experience regardless of the file format that was contained in these collections. The right-hand side shows the metadata reconciliation, useful but not as useful as it could have been, uh, as I will discuss a little bit later. Some findings. First off, it was pretty uh, fun to use, um, surfacing items from unexpected collections held by unexpected institutions. 
but the reconciliation was pretty uh, limited. Uh, there was lots of data and only two people working on this prototype to review it. Uh, each repository created their own uh, schemas, terms, and vocabularies. So as I mentioned, lots of heterogeneous fields and terms. The headings not derived from controlled vocabularies also have quite limited results. But the, the effort also gave us more experience in mapping data uh, for discovery purposes. So we took a step back in the second phase of this pilot uh, to look at the workflow for cultural heritage materials in creating linked data from scratch. What would this be for a library using this as a native uh, platform? Since the second part of the experiment would include librarians creating and managing metadata, we needed to scale back a bit, uh, working with just five users supplying three collections each. The metadata was manually reconciled with OpenRefine, but heavily reliant on the domain expertise of those curating the collections. We also leveraged what we knew from using Wikibase and Project Passage. So here's that search for Louis Armstrong again with a much smaller record set based on the smaller uh, starting point that we had. But even though the record set is smaller, the more detailed reconciliation exposes more specific and more granular metadata compared to the record shown earlier. We can also suss out more of the semantics, for example, depicted instead of simply about. And if you click on that depicted link, this is now a structured data query, eight results now instead of the original 10. That structured data tied to entities can facilitate a lower recall, but much higher precision. This also shows us that we can leverage more of the contextual data. For example, Armstrong himself is an entity within the system we prototyped. We see here a description, name, aliases, and statements about him birth date, and other links to external systems. The other advantage of Wikibase, combining with the advantages of the platform in IIIF, for coding the images themselves, makes it easier to add more information about the image. The metadata pulled in can be reviewed and changed, as shown here, by changing about to depicts. You can also alter the image itself and then the associated metadata, or zoom in for more context, like trumpet is depicted. And as we learned from Glenn yesterday, IIIF becomes an important feature to create URIs for subsections of the image. We have granular metadata descriptions associated with our object, but that metadata can also be pushed back into the description itself. I think IIIF will be one of the most important uh, production level uh, uh, linked data applications that we'll see in libraries. So some findings, and maybe not the lesson we wanted to hear, but it takes a lot of human work to create deep semantic representation of metadata descriptions and special collections. We learned even more about Wikibase as a platform, its flexible infrastructure for creating, managing, and curating structured data, and we could potentially fit more needs of online learning and user expectations uh, for cultural heritage materials. So if you'd like to wow your party guests, you might want to slip semantic continuum into the conversation, but really this is just my way of thinking about the two projects I've described and how they might fit together. We, we can build a shared homogeneous and centralized set of entities, but we must also account for the reality of localized heterogeneous and decentralized collections that will be represented by linked data. We can do machine matching and a highly uh, automated reconciliation, but we need tools for hand matching semi-automated reconciliation efforts. We can build around a well-accepted context like person and works, although you'd be surprised how many debates still continue about what is a person or what is a work. Um, but we, can also need to, we also need to look at the more granular context with things like about, depicts, annotations, and notes uh, that are prevalent in archives and special collections. We have found that the, these efforts blur the line between bibliographic and authority work. In special collections, we find that these efforts and linked data blur the line between object and context description. And I think these are good things. Something that both these projects have in common is that custom applications and their interfaces are still needed 
uh, in this effort. But I think combined, these efforts will help define the new knowledge work that uh, catalogers and special collections librarians will be doing going forward. My final slide, some next steps around all three of these areas. In the shared entity management infrastructure, we are targeting uh, millions, tens of millions of entities in the infrastructure by the end of this calendar year, December 2020. And then a completion of the project, focusing on works and persons, as I mentioned, by December 2021. In the content DM link data pilot, we want to evaluate how to better balance that algorithmic record conversion with the domain knowledge expertise and what libraries can do to prepare for this uh, dramatic shift from record management to entity management. Determine how to pull apart a contextual metadata and descriptive metadata, uh, explore and leverage the new contextual metadata and end user applications. And as I mentioned, a report on this project is forthcoming uh, later this calendar year. We also need more research. A decade of research has proven that more context does provide for, for better linking. So we need to have uh, more contextual metadata. We know from our experiences with FAST and Dewey that lexical matching is very difficult. Link data for concepts because of their local and specialized nature are going to present uh, many new challenges, I think in order of magnitude more difficult than works and persons. And finally, uh, looking at archives and special collections areas and moving forward from the content DM prototype uh, and looking at the, uh, another OCLC recent report, archives and special collections and linked data, navigating between notes and nodes, uh, we know that this, there will be more and uh, special challenges as we look at distinctive collections. So with that, uh, here's some information to contact me if you need to. Uh, and then when our other presenters are done, I'll be happy to take questions as well. Thank you. Jen, I think you're still muted. Oh, I haven't started. Oh. Oh, I'm <laughs> I uh, thank you, Andrew. I'll be speaking, but I without knowing my um, mic is. Uh, was muted. Our next presenter uh, is Jeanette Norris. Uh, she's a metadata uh, specialist at uh, University, uh, Yale University Library. Jeanette, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much, Jen, and to the DCMI conference um, coordinators and, um, and to everyone who is here today. I'm really happy to be here. I'm talking on this subject. So, uh, as Jen said, I uh, work at Yale University Libraries. I currently am a manager of one of the cataloging units there. And um, the unit that I, I work with um, is really focused on, on sort of the traditional production of um, bibliographic descriptions and authority records uh, about the collection. Um, and, and so that really frames the way that I, I think about this. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about some overarching concepts, uh, walk through three different projects that I was in, I've been involved in, one at Yale and two at Brown University Library, where I was previously, and then um, some takeaways. So um, as you can tell from my title, uh, really I'm focused on, on with, in terms of these projects, focusing on balance, sustainability, and broadening roles within uh, library metadata and cataloging. So by way of another introduction, um, I thought that I would share a little bit about a hobby. So I started years ago um, with sort of container gardening in my own apartment. And it's a really nice sort of closed space um, where I can control almost all the variables. Um, and then I moved to a house and I have a yard that I'm supposed to manage. And all of a sudden you can see that um, on the right hand side is a, uh, a garden design for something that I hope to have um, produced by next spring. So this is a, a vast change in, in both complexity, um, but also opportunity. And I think that it's a nice metaphor for what we're doing with metadata right now in libraries and thinking about um, the way that we've come from a very closed and controlled world, and we are you know, burgeoning on opportunities for engaging in the broader world, um, but that also comes with it greater, you know, a need for greater knowledge and need to be able to control for and understand a greater number of variables. Um, so this context is not at all surprising, but I feel like it's important um, to bring up in this panel 
as a librarian and as you know a practitioner that in reality we are balancing production um, with the need to develop new skills design new services and products and make sure that we are both meeting um, those very specific and time-driven needs to, to get materials out of the door and well described um, with the need to develop new things and to develop right, the, these deep semantic representations of, of the objects in our collections and the context in which they exist. Um, but so this drives everything, right, that, um, that we constantly strive to, to make this work. And so when I think about these projects, um, I always think about what scope we can reasonably manage. And that can change drastically depending on the type of organization and institution that you're at. Um, how I can use them to create or further develop long-term relationships. Um, how I can scaffold skills. So, um, you know, based off of what we already have, what do we need to gain? And um, how can we make sure that we can use skills that we've already had training on? Um, and always keep in mind what it is that we should be building. Uh, it's really great to go after Andrew's presentation where you can think about my institution, even though we are a very large research library, uh, maybe shouldn't be building the same things that OCLC can do better, right? So thinking about where we need to leverage those partnerships and what it is that we should be building versus what we should be relying on others for. So again, um, thinking in terms of balance, sustainability, and a strategic vision for metadata so that we know that we're building in a direction that actually makes sense for us and brings us somewhere. So now I'm going to just um, talk through three different projects that um, I've been involved in. Um, and I think that they speak to different ways in which this happens and the types of work um, um, that can happen in libraries. So the first is the project, uh, the program for cooperative cataloging um, is an pilot project. Um, so I did this project at Brown and um, we knew that we didn't have much time or many resources to devote to the project. So we made it relatively small. Um, so first of all, we only were focusing on 230 entities um, that we wanted to make sure were represented in ISNI. And those were uh, the 230 um, academic departments and programs at the university. We had five staff members uh, working on the project, myself included as the project manager. We only took about four weeks in the end. The project was supposed to last for much longer, but we were a little bit slow getting off the ground. Um, and our strategy for this project was to make sure that it was focused on the university. Um, and that was so that we could uh, demonstrate the value um, to people more easily. And part of it was that these departments intersected with four other um, library projects. So we weren't just having an ISNI project for the catalog department, but it touched our um, researching, or sorry, our researcher's profile system. It touched our digital collections, our catalog, and then our finding aids. And could also help us, um, you know, link to information on the Brown websites as well. And so what this did was even though the project itself was quite small, um, it gave us leverage to start building projects afterwards. And so one of the outcomes of this project was the ability for the cataloging and metadata department to go to our programmers and, um, and say that we can help manage the data about these entities in ISNI, and then you can pull the data out and you can leverage it in all these four different systems. And so that's a really powerful example of how a relatively small project can lead to deeper relationships and better discoverability across the board. Another project, um, which is linked data adjacent, I would say, is um, the implementation of FAST at Brown. So FAST is primarily used in digital collections metadata, um, including our repository, uh, which includes um, theses and dissertations. So what I want to um, focus on here is the fact that you don't actually have to be using linked data as linked data. Uh, in order to, um, to solve an existing problem, right? So our problem here was that our um, physical dissertations and our electronic dissertations couldn't be indexed together because they had different types of information. Um, and we were relying on uncontrolled keywords provided by authors for subject access. Um, and so this project was really about 
using tools that, that were already existed, um, using fast headings uh, to reconcile fast headings with those keywords and provide some controlled vocabulary um, and some controlled subject access for these materials. And so this again speaks to something that, that Andrew has already talked about, which is, um, you know, that you can do a lot with these automated methods uh, with the information that you have. Um, and it's certainly not perfect, but it is a much better user experience now than it once was. And so again, there were three people involved in this project. It took about a semester. Um, and again, what we were focused on was creating a sustainable solution to an existing problem. And we were just building skills while we were doing it. So the sustainable solution for this in this case was um, not only did we do the retrospective reconciliation, but then we also built in fast into our forms that authors fill out and we can make it so that uh, cataloging and metadata staff can just check that data instead of having to input it themselves. And again, it's about creating these collaborative interdepartmental um, relationships and making sure that we are focused on um, improving the infrastructure, even if we are not doing you know, the most exciting work at that moment, um, that we're really providing some sort of service. Um, and that also makes it easier to sort of justify and explain the work that you're doing. So then finally, um, the third project I want to talk about is uh, the Link Data for Production Pathway to Implementation project. And this has been, um, this was a project at Yale. I was only there for the last couple of months of it. Um, so I know that there was a lot of work that went into it. Um, but so this scope was slightly different and it goes back to um, a couple of different points that I've been making. So the scope was um, to create records in Synopia. So Synopia is a linked data editor that is developed out of um, Stanford. And we were creating records for a collection of Civil War pamphlets. We were also transforming records with the Share VDE team from Mark and to Link Data, and also experimenting with software called Metafactory uh, to develop a user interface that used this data. So there were 27 active project members on this team, um, and again, it um, a, a big piece of this was about inter interdepartmental collaboration. So leveraging relationships across the university and indeed um, across the Link Data for Production cohort and, um, and vendors like ShareVDE, right? Um, and another big piece of this was taking the time to develop staff skills. So there were 27 active park, uh, sorry, active project members I want to say there were about 15 people on the uh, metadata creation team who are actually taking these pamphlets and creating uh, linked data descriptions um, directly for them. And we were building off of the work that had already been done, has, sorry, has already been done on the art and rare materials extension for BibFrame. So there's a lot of um, connection here between um, work that has been happening at other institutions, work that's of interest at Yale, and also um, starting to develop some of these skills and expertise needed to um, move forward with these types of projects. So the themes that I've noticed here um, is that you acquire balance, right? And that, that scope uh, can change drastically depending on the size of the institution and the goals of the institution. Um, so in many cases, an extremely narrowly scoped project can be um, more effective than one that has grand dreams, right? Um, for sustainability, it needs to address current needs that are facing your institution, um, because otherwise you're just not going to find the time to work on it, in my experience. Um, and finally, that it's about broadening perspectives. So encouraging cross-departmental collaboration, thinking about uh, what you can do to help other members in your organization, even outside of the library, um, but also with institutions uh, more broadly. Um, so this is a great example. Um, you know, this conference is a great example of, of finding those connections, but also reaching out to the people, um, either other institutions or um, other organizations that you know are working on things that might be of interest to you. And from a very, you know, 
very uncomprehensive uh, look at some literature about these types of projects. What I've noticed is that resources feel limited, even at the most well-resourced institutions, right? So no one um, has all the time in the world to work on these projects. Everyone feels the, um, the pressure of, of being as efficient as possible and of making sure that every moment that you're at work counts. Um, so even at the smallest school or the largest research library, we're feeling similar feelings, even if we're, our scales are totally different. Um, there's also so many opportunities for involvement now that it can be difficult to know what the best investment is. Um, and this is a fantastic change from the past where it was hard to know where to get started. Uh, there is so much work happening with entity management right now um, that really it's about choosing something that is meaningful for your organization. And finally, making sure that project participation um, really takes advantage of the opportunity to develop skills and perspective and help people progress in their careers. So this is a very personal thing, um, which I have noted in a number of the articles, but also in my colleagues as they work through these projects. So um, finally, I want to just make some recommendations. Um, so when you're thinking about pursuing one of these, or if you're in the middle of it and you're not sure where to go, I would really focus on staff development, um, making sure that we have colleagues and staff members who are ready to be creative and take on new challenges requires spending some time developing skills and perspective that's broader than our, you know, our single potted plant, um, that we actively use those new skills going to training is not enough. You have to actually find ways to put them into practice. Um, and finally, that they need to be incorporated into existing work. Um, so that doesn't mean that we need to supplant something that already happens, but that it needs to somehow play with the things that we're already doing and make sure um, that we're really solving existing problems for our users. So right, take advantage of existing work. Um, we all know there's too much to do. So um, make sure that you're developing solutions to existing problems. Incorporate elements of a new infrastructure. So even if you're not working in linked data right now, making sure that you're building out that sort of framework that you can use later. Find opportunities to help other departments. I think that that helping is really key. So you're not asking them for favors, but you're really developing something with them and making sure that we communicate um, what we can do, right, as metadata professionals for other people. And make sure that you join other collaborators and project leaders, um, especially, actually, I was going to say especially, but no, it doesn't matter. Um, anyone, right, can benefit from taking advantage of the expertise and the um, resources of anybody else. So that could be OCLC, that can be the prog program for cooperative cataloging, that can be the LD4P members, right? There's a lot of people doing a lot of work in this area that have built a lot of infrastructure already. That can be Wikidata, which is a fantastic resource and opportunity. So remember that these projects are not resume padding. It's not just something that you do because it's cool. Um, what we're doing is building scaffolding for service improvement, um, for diversity, diversification, for greater impact, and for staff success. And at the end of the day, we have to make sure that everything we're doing serves a current problem. So here are some image credits and thanks. Thank you, Jeanette. Wow, wonderful. Um, I like the, uh, uh, the practical um, uh, workflow aspect of your presentation. That's, uh, I believe, uh, uh, some of uh, our audience will have questions for you in, in that aspect. And our next presenter uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, Brian Dabraski, who is an assistant professor at the iSchool um, at uh, University of uh, Tennessee, Knoxville campus. Uh, Brian? Are you, have you unmuted yourself? Sorry. 
<laughs> today. Uh, are you able to see my uh, screen, my slides there? Yes. Okay, great. Now, let me just get my monitor set up here. I'm just like you, I'm like looking at three different setups. So, yeah. okay, uh, so I'm really pleased to be here uh, today and especially to be following up on uh, some of the points that Andrew and Jeanette mentioned. Uh, my name is Brian Dabreski. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Information Sciences at University of uh, Tennessee, Knoxville. And in my presentation today, I'm going to be sharing some findings on the state and future of linked data topics in metadata education, uh, giving an overview of research and developments in both continuing education and informal graduate program education. So I'll do so while trying to frame it within the question we've been uh, dealing with today, which is, uh, you know, deep semantic representation in, in, uh, in resource description. So how can we prepare uh, library, archive, and museum professionals to take part in those activities? Um, so uh, as we've already seen, libraries, archives, museums uh, have long recognized now the potentials of linked data and the increased functionality and discoverability that comes with leveraging semantic representation. Uh, for example, linked data and semantic web began appearing in the LIS literature actually around 1999 and then really took off uh, as a, a topic of growing interest around 2005. Uh, now there's actually some evidence that this topic plateaued in 2013 and has declined a little since then, but there's various reasons for that. Uh, suffice to say it is still a very important topic in this domain. Uh, the literature also shows uh, somewhat expectedly perhaps uh, a, a shift from linked data as a hypothetical interest to real projects to the uh, we did it good here kinds of reports. Uh, and getting here has required that metadata professionals uh, pick up not only a new understanding of concepts and models but tangible data skills as well. For current metadata practitioners, and we saw some of this with Jeanette's uh, presentation there, developing these skills kind of come through active work, right, or taking part in some continuing education support. A uh, 2012 study uh, found that semantic web fluency required a grasp of very different models and tools and standards than was coming from traditional metadata education at the time. Uh, the author found signs of development around the understanding and use of things like ontologies and vocabularies, but uh, felt much less confident about practitioners' actual data transformation and publication capabilities at that time. Now, a few years later in uh, 2018, a survey found that a number of institutions had uh, by then become more involved in local exploratory projects or grant-funded collaborations involving linked data. The survey revealed a growing amount of staff, both uh, existing and new staff, dedicated to linked data activities or taking part in some kind of linked data responsibilities, I should say. Uh, so there are many new opportunities emerging for developing these skills for folks who are in the workforce. Um, despite these developments, uh, some other recent surveys have shown that major barriers do still persist in terms of training and continuing education around linked data, uh, citing specifically ongoing difficulty in finding appropriate learning resources, and then perhaps one of the most recurring ones is uncertainty about which particular skills and which standards will prove most important in this kind of quickly changing uh, environment. Um, that being said, there are some more comprehensive continuing education options that have become available. Uh, for example, uh, the European Euclid project, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, uh, but that's a free modular curriculum of open educational resources focused on uh, deploying and um, building visualizations and querying and, and other kind of functional skills with linked data. And it's specifically focused on the needs of working practitioners. There are many other uh, continuing education opportunities for professionals out there, uh, but uh, they kind of have become scattered across different open resources, I should say. Um, the good news is that there are more and more opportunities out there for folks to learn about linked data. And we have some very trusted organizations like OCLC, uh, like Leopard Congress, the Europeana Project, who provide some really great background information and supporting materials for folks who are interested in getting started. Uh, there are many other sources out there which might be harder for folks to identify and assess. Uh, but luckily there have been some projects designed to assist uh, continuing education learners in understanding and leveraging these opportunities. So 
And there's kind of two main approaches going on in this area. Uh, the first one I'll highlight is a centralized approach. Uh, a good example of this is the Euclid project, which I mentioned a little earlier. It was a project in the mid 2010s funded by the seventh framework program. And it was designed to meet the needs of practitioners who are in need of updating their um, skill sets, well, their understanding and their skill sets, right? Uh, it resulted in a set of six uh, modules based around functional skills, such as querying and integrating and visualizing, and also resulted in a uh, nice little companion guidebook. The other approach is a more decentralized uh, approach focused on organizing and annotating resources from other sources. Uh, the competency index for linked data is a decentralized approach. Um, it resulted from a series of funded projects uh, for LD4PE, the linked data for professional educators. It has a similar focus to Euclid in that um, it's designed to meet the needs of information professionals. It, it originally took the form of an articulation of key learning topics and now has been more fully developed as a kind of annotated index of topics matched with competencies, goals, and corresponding open educational resources. Uh, now, I gather many folks in here today are probably familiar with this, but I'll just uh, remind us briefly of how uh, the competency index works here. We are looking at a snippet of the competency index showing competencies, goals, and benchmarks around RDF. Now, for the competency of uh, finding RDF-based vocabularies, we can then refer to um, this curated list of associated resources, and we are led to uh, vetted resources for learning this particular competence and the set of skills underneath it. Um, so uh, we already know that practitioners have opportunities to learn skills on the job. There's also continuing uh, education resources out there. They have their own sets of challenges and opportunities. Uh, what about students and emerging professionals? Um, so in information science, uh, it's quite often that we have students arrive with some kind of uh, cataloging skills or metadata skills. They've done some work in that area. Very, very rarely would we have any students arrive who know something already about RDF or ontologies or things like that. So they're coming in with a very different baseline uh, than even other information organization topics. So preparing students to engage in semantic representation requires this kind of multi-layered approach of giving conceptual background and technical skills together. Uh, 2014 review of graduate level curriculum in information organization highlighted uh, that future metadata professionals must be prepared to see their work as taking place in linked environments and not just solo projects. Uh, and because of this, it's more important to understand things like RDF and the semantic web in general. Um, so, Shifting from continuing ed then to formal graduate education now, uh, as we observed earlier, uh, linked data started taking off in library and information science areas around 2005 or so. And we start to see a growing interest in teaching linked data begin around the same time. Uh, for example, teaching linked data was first um, discussed in uh, JELIS, the Journal of Education in Library and Information Science uh, in 2007. So that was kind of its first appearance there when uh, people began writing and talking about teaching linked data uh, in this domain. As with any other uh, emerging information and technology area, educators are posed with the same kinds of common questions. So where is the balance between teaching concepts and teaching skills? And what objectives exist for students in this area? What is it really important for them to know uh, whether they're uh, just whether they're interested in, in taking part in metadata work or not, what should all information science students know about this? Uh, it's also important to note, though, that linked data education occurs outside of LIS programs as well. Uh, and I will example, or I'm gonna highlight um, linked data in computer science and engineering education as well as an example of that. Um, but uh, first, as far as LIS programs are concerned, um, the curriculum, of course, is guided by ALA accreditation. Uh, the accreditation has very little to say on uh, specific topics, though. Uh, in 2017, however, we did see ALEX, which is a subgroup of ALA uh, focused on collection and technical services. Uh, they released their competencies for cataloging and metadata professionals, which offers some insights to us uh, in terms of the place of linked data in the LIS curriculum. The competencies here were meant to outline 
uh, kind of baseline knowledge and skills and behaviors that cataloging and metadata uh, professionals should have. Uh, arguably, everything in here is um, useful to people taking uh, part in linked data activities, uh, but most explicit references to linked data um, are at the knowledge level rather than at the skills level. In just a second, my screen is doing something strange. All right, sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, the uh, most of the stuff about linked data in here is at the conceptual level. It's at the knowledge level rather in the section about skills and competencies. So overall, it shows a focus on uh, conceptual understanding and, and a lesser focus on technical skills here. Uh, if we take a look at the LIS curriculum, though, this is not entirely the case. We do see coverage of both concepts and skills. Uh, so first we see uh, introduction courses in information organization have begun more and more to cover linked data content, uh, particularly at the conceptual level. Uh, and that was noted in uh, 2010, and it's certainly continued to increase since then. We've also seen the development of some dedicated linked data courses in some programs, for example, the ontology design course at University of Washington, or Pratt's uh, linked open data for libraries, archives, and museums, which has been offered regularly since about 2014. Uh, both of these cover concepts and technical skills. More commonly, though, linked data's place in the LIS curriculum has been in the form of uh, special topics courses, which may only be offered once, depending on interest, uh, faculty availability, and such. Uh, overall, in the LIS curriculum, most emphasis has remained on the foundations of linked data, including ontologies, data models, and vocabularies, and uh, less emphasis on individual technical skills or standards. Um, in contrast, if we take a look at how linked data is taught in computer science and engineering programs, there's a different approach here. Um, and, and actually, this area saw some of the earliest dedicated courses in linked data, including MIT's linked data ventures class, which started in 2010 and was actually initially co-taught by Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, in the past 10 year, linked data courses have become fairly routine offerings at both the undergraduate and graduate level in computer science and engineering. Uh, you can see a few examples of course names and institutions here. Perhaps not uh, surprisingly, the contrast uh, with LIS here is that the overall focus has been on uh, technical specifications, publishing, and application development. So resituating ourselves back in the LIS space, what are some of the shortcomings associated with teaching linked data right now? Uh, in contrast with uh, computer science engineering, we can already see one, and I think we heard uh, Jeanette talk a little bit about this as well as challenges involved in developing technical skills. There's a really interesting study um, in 2015, which reviewed library and information science courses that were focused on technology and compared the topics in these courses to job postings on the Code for Lib site. Uh, the author found that linked data topics were slowly gaining momentum in the curriculum uh, but that linked data was actually one of the least frequently offered topics in LIS programs at that time. Uh, interestingly, the author also found that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, linked data and semantic web topics were appearing in other courses beyond metadata courses as well. So they were present in courses in information architecture and in web design uh, in LIS programs as well. So what are some ways uh, that we have tried to address these challenges and shortcomings in linked data education for metadata professionals, trying to prepare them to work with linked data? Uh, one approach is, of course, new course offerings, offerings designed to cover different aspects of this topic. Uh, for example, uh, Miller and other faculty at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, the school known for its uh, focus on information organization topics, uh, reviewed their curriculum development uh, in this publication here. And it, they saw the development of two classes, one kind of situated in practice uh, and another more situated within concepts and foundations. Uh, one thing that the faculty admitted to struggling with uh, here was uh, particularly in regards to that first class about linked data for libraries, uh, was waiting to see what libraries would actually be doing in the field. So what are they trying to implement? What systems are they using? What standards are they using? 
Um, the tie between practice and teaching is always very critical, but uh, even today remains somewhat unclear to us, especially in linked data topics. Um, another direction, apart from just developing new courses, has just been to adjust metadata courses to better incorporate linked data topics. Uh, for example, Zeng and Chin's Metadata 2nd Edition, we see linked data topics spread more evenly throughout the text. Uh, ontologies are introduced quite early on, as are RDF and XML. So beginning to think of linked data not as a special uh, new topic, but as part of the regular fabric of uh, metadata and metadata work. And of course, another option is to better leverage what we know about continuing education, for example, um, uh, there's been some effort working on developing classroom curriculum around the linked data competency index. Uh, it is important here to note that many students do not carry all the prerequisite skills and understandings that a practitioner would know. So there's kind of an extra level of assessment involved in pairing with open educational resources here. So where do we go from here? How should we be teaching linked data topics to metadata practitioners? Uh, first, uh, we see the trend of linked data topics spreading throughout the curriculum uh, from foundation courses to metadata electives to other kinds of classes. I think it shows that we do not always need linked data to be a separate course. It can be incorporated into metadata and to other course offerings there. Um, if separate courses are offered, it might be uh, an option to spin off conceptual elements into one course, such as like an ontology taxonomy design course, and then we uh, practical integration skills for another kind of course. Uh, as always, special topics courses remain an important source of flexibility and responsiveness in curriculum design uh, in any area, but particularly here right now. Uh, as linked data and so, uh, semantic web are appearing in other LIS courses, um, you know, I think finding synergy uh, within the curriculum is always a good thing. So finding some synergy and harmony between metadata, information architecture, web design, uh, how this topic is handled among them, I think will allow linked data to more fully develop in a, a graduate curriculum. I was actually just talking to a web developer uh, recently, and uh, we were both trying to explain to each other what it is we do and what we're interested in. And we were having a bit of a difficult time kind of finding common ground until the topic of semantic web came up. And then suddenly uh, it's like it clicked and we were speaking the same language. We talked about REFA and microformats and things like that. Uh, so there are those connections there. So trying to find them and better leverage them, uh, even in courses that are not perhaps a metadata course. Also, when thinking about uh, supporting the development of more technical skills, uh, we can look to other disciplines like computer science and engineering, which have been focusing on the development of those technical skills for some time now. Uh, still, there are uh, many challenges in graduate LIS uh, uh, education. Uh, the biggest one, a long-standing problem, and would come up probably anything, any topic we talk about is simply finding room. Uh, we know that intro courses in information organization have become uh, much more crowded over time. Uh, at the same time, information organization courses are still lacking some critical topics. Uh, there's a growing need to understand the social and ethical implementation, uh, implications of representation and I think this is a big area for further development in metadata and linked data education. So finding room for that as well is important. Uh, another trend is that LIS programs um, tend to have a shrinking, uh, shrinking set of core classes and a growing number of electives. And that provides some flexibility, but it challenges us to give students a common baseline. And students are also challenged in terms of trying to uh, uh, kind of choose a specialization, try to design a, a program of study for themselves that will help them learn what they need to do. So um, some, some other challenges associated with that. Uh, and finally, as we've heard, developing technical skills will likely remain a challenge. There's lots of open educational resource support here, but it's difficult to kind of create or give an infrastructure for students to actually practice. Uh, we need them to actually put these skills into use to have a reason to use them. Uh, to kind of further uh, teaching in this area. And of course, there are still questions around what standards, what skills, uh, what particular tasks are most helpful for them to practice. Uh, so overall, we see linked data topics are increasingly present in LIS programs, though they take several different approaches, different appearances when they, when they are there. Um, other disciplines have featured a greater focus on technical skills and continuing education resources also offer more in-depth technical skills too. 
and both of these could be leveraged in order uh, to, uh, to modify LIS education, I think. Uh, so for active practitioners, for new professionals, for students, uh, there remains the need for developing both conceptual and technical skills. I think, uh, at least in graduate programs, it's going to require a little bit more emphasis on the technical skills to match the progress we've made in uh, building conceptual skills already. Uh, that is, uh, that's it. Thank you, Brian. Uh, well, now um, our uh, presentations uh, are all completed. Um, so let me, uh, okay. Um, so it's, uh, it's our uh, question, Q&A time, but uh, I just want to say a few words uh, ahead of uh, the question session. And I really uh, appreciate our panelists' um, presentation and because their presentations provided insights into what's going on uh, in the field, the cutting edge progress made at uh, uh, OCLC research, as well as the, uh, um, you know, the practice at Yale uh, University Library and uh, Brian's insightful uh, report about uh, LIS education regarded, um, um, regarded the uh, linked data. So I think we have uh, a lot to digest, uh, but all very refreshing, very uh, inspiring. So I'm hoping to, uh, to see more questions uh, and, uh, and think our uh, panelists are ready uh, to answer uh, any of your question. So from the chat room, I have a, a first question, uh, I think asked by uh, Tom Baker. Uh, he was wondering about uh, what, um, in, in Andrew's presentation, he mentioned about entity management. And I think that uh, paradigm shift from record to entity uh, is a very, you know, <laughs> um, cutting edge uh, thinking. And so, uh, but what is entity? Tom Baker raised this question. Um, let me let me give it a shot, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll look for some help from Jeanette and Brian too. So I I, I think I'm, I'm getting Tom's point about sort of the sense of entity. So our definition in terms of the project is that an entity is something that is worth describing. It's worth identifying. It's worth naming. It's worth describing. It's a persistent, resolvable identifier. Um, so the, the Wikipedia definition is actually pretty good too. It's anything that claims independent existence um, as opposed to merely being part of the whole, right? So, you know, fields in a record sometimes feel more like they're part of a whole. Um, so whether as a subject or as an object, it's, you know, actually or potentially um, concrete. Um, if, if, if that helps a, a little bit. So I think it's, it's maybe, um, Compared to his example of, of, of resource, it's more scoped than resource. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be identified. You know, resource doesn't necessarily have to be identified or believed to exist in a common sense way. So hopefully that helps. Um, Tom, do you have any uh, um, follow up to uh, Andrew's reply to your question? Uh, yeah, I think you can talk. <laughs> Right. Let me see. Let me get to. He says he's fine. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hold on. I need to find Tom's name in the attendees list. Attendee, yes. And he said he was good with my answer. Yeah, no, I'm here. Um, it's uh, I, um, I I wrote that's 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 fine. I was looking for the operative uh, definition because since so many of the projects um, are have entity in their title, um, and um, and it occurred to me that um, uh, I don't know what the history of entity is in library science. Um, but I think that we're looking at a, um, a at a shift 
in the meaning of terms and and, and that entity is um, is is I, I believe something um, new in that context. And so I was just wondering whether um, whether uh, it had caused the term has caused any confusion or um, is it uh, pretty intuitively understandable um, and um, maybe the answer is that um, nobody has seen it as a problem, which would be uh, which would be an interesting answer. Um, but I just wanted to raise the question since it's in the title of so many projects. Yeah, cool. Um, I don't see any other questions from the uh, chat, so I'm going to raise my own. Uh, ask a, a uh, question. So Jen, Jen, there is a question from oh. uh, Anna -Anna Marie Closer. Uh, I didn't see it. In the chat room? Oh, oh, here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I missed that one. Uh, the question is, one of the uh, challenges that I often uh, encounter is uh, balancing the needs for interoperable metadata through linked data and international standards with local practices and the local teams. Do any of the uh, presenters want to address how they see balancing local metadata considerations with linked data? Uh, I think that's the, uh, the question. Any, um, so let's take turn. Uh, perhaps we uh, can uh, let uh, Jeanette to go first to uh, um, addressing this question. Sure, I'll just echo that this is a huge concern even before um, linked data, right? That we are reliant on so many different vocabularies and vendors and systems to update our data and to manage it, that anytime we go to something local, it really complicates everything. On the other hand, a lot of the things that we want to describe aren't really covered um, in, in vocabularies the way that we expect them or, and sometimes it's the language that's being used for labels um, that someone might you know, have difficulty with. Um, remember there was one project that we were working on where the terminology around um, alcohol use was um, problematic for the researcher because they didn't like the way that it was framed, right? So it's one of these sort of very contextual and it goes back to the, um, you know, how we frame things really, really impacts what we say. Um, so I would say that I still focus on interoperability whenever possible um, and try to sneak in some, some local as needed. I think that there's work that's happening that might help with this. Part of that is the Wikidata work. So something that is a little bit easier to start managing um, while also providing you something to, to bounce against is, is going to be really useful. And part of it is conversations that have started, though I think that it goes back to the technical problems um, around, at least I know this is happening in the FAST community, um, around ways to leverage the identifier to match on concepts while allowing local institutions to choose which version of that label to use. And so I think that that combination gives us a nice starting point to start to address some of these really long-standing difficult um, problems. Uh, other, thank you, uh, Jeanette. Um, Andrew or Brian, do you have any follow-up with this question? Yeah, I think, I think we're gonna have a lot of focus here. So if you think back to the slide I had about the initial mass aggregation we did when it was 20 million um, images, and in, in order to make some of that reconciliation work really well, we had to, we looked, we limited the strings to the ones that occurred more than 2000 times, which is a lot, <laughs> right? And so, you know, we, we were immediately having to combat that heterogeneous, uh, you know, the nature where the repository had its own schema, it had its own terms, it had its own voc vocabularies, um, even if they were, you know, maybe all using Dublin Core, for example, too. Um, so it makes it pretty hard to reconcile. So I think, you know, part of what's going to come out, I think one of the things that you'll see in the Content DM link data pilot report um, is that there's probably some work and tools that can be provided that will prepare repositories for this transition, 
right? Because um, one of the challenges is that these sort of legacy applications that are being run, you can build the you can build the link data, you can build the URIs, but putting those URIs back into the old system doesn't actually help the old system very much. <laughs> Um, so I think that what, one of the things that we're going to see is sort of this transitional period um, of what are the tools and services that we can build, acknowledging that these legacy systems are going to exist for some time. So a, an example of this might be um, the, the dollar zero, dollar one URIs and mark records, right? You know, so you know, OCLC is not going to flip a switch and mark records go away, right? But we can build a transitional period in which we're putting URIs for work or for persons. Uh, into mark records to help with that transition. I think the same will be be true of, of special collections. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Brian, do you have a, a, any follow up for this? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have anything further to add. Okay. Um, our next question uh, is from uh, Paul Walker. Um, she said, uh, he said, uh, uh, I'm interested to hear the panelists' thoughts on how we might navigate the path between dynamic, easy to use um, systems such as Wikidata and the need to develop and manage some stable uh, foundations such as the Dublin Core uh, metadata terms to underpin global linked data. Can I jump in first and just say I would also like to know? <laughs> <laughs> sure. you, know for us, you know, in education, like this is a big question. What do I need to teach uh, students to be aware of? And, and most often it's just, you know, we learn the foundational concepts, we learn stuff like Dublin Core, and then they know that out in the field they're going to have to apply principles to, you know, whatever platform they're able to use to whatever, um, you know, project or systems are out there. So that's kind of uh, one of the things that paralyzes us a little bit in teaching linked data right now is also not knowing the answer to this. So I'm hoping Jeanette and Andrew <laughs> have some more insight than I do. That was also my feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have, I have kind of a running joke internally that you know the 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 Wikidata community was unburdened by a hundred years of practice, um, right? You know, and and so I I think that you know that the transition right um is going to be well I, I think it can be helped i think wikibase is also an advantage right so wikibase is distinguished from wikidata right here's a here's a here's a thing that you can download here's a thing that you can use it's got some pretty nice docker implementations um things that you know make it easy to easier to install than it was when we started project passage um and you know, we, we became enamored of its uh, its the ease in which you can create triples in which we could represent a graph um you know, Wikidata allows for constraints without requiring them, uh, right? And if, if you compare that to, you, know, you, you compare that new practice in managing entities to an old practice of um, uh, approvals for authorities, um, uh, authority infrastructures that don't allow for easy additions, you know, when you don't find what you're looking for, um, so authority records, VOF, you know, lots of these things. If you if you don't find what you're looking for, you need a path to do that. So um, I think there's going to be I think we're going to be experimenting with this for a while um, in that time of transition. So that's not really an answer. Just I think we're we're in that sort of um, you know slope of enlightenment on the Gartner curve and and how we manage that. Great, uh, Jeanette. So I would just say that we are certainly still relying on large institutions with a lot of data and a lot of um, scalable ability uh, to help to solve some of these problems. So part of it is just making sure that there is um, a commitment to maintaining the data um, and maintaining those services. So whether or not they're vocabularies or they're um, repositories of triples or, or whatever. Um, and when it comes to what to teach, I mean, right now, the things that I value most in, in colleagues and staff members and um, 
are really these flexible skills that are built on the foundations that allow them to not think just in terms of linked data projects, but really think in terms of how do I solve this data problem. And so a lot of that is having some understanding of the technical underpinnings so that they know what the implications are of their decisions and also knowing what options there are. But really, I mean, I expect that this field is going to change so much that um, I don't want someone who came in with just a, a solid foundation in Mark or a solid foundation in BibFrame, um, but who knows enough of the foundation that they can apply it to whatever they come across and enough technical skills to learn whatever system they, they run into. Um, so I think that, right, I mean, I, I, I am also waiting for, for someone to come up with some sort of a triple store that, that we can pull from. And it's pretty clear that's not exactly going to happen. Um, and so things like Wikidata are really key right now because it starts to solve some of the longstanding problems that we've had while also not um, damaging the, you know, the very closed and controlled environments that we have so carefully created that I think also have a lot of power that we can't recreate elsewhere yet. Thank you both, uh, uh, Jeanette and uh, Andrew for answering that question. And um, I also see Athena uh, asked a question um, about, um, to Brian, this is to Brian, uh, the background course that the computer science uh, students are exposed to are not the same as the LIS students. How much can you fit in one or two courses um, in parentheses often a limitation of a very general uh, graduate program. Right, yeah. So hi, hi, Athena. Yes, good question. Um, so the computer science students, right, they're coming from a very different uh, paradigm, uh, both conceptually and uh, the way education works there. Uh, we do see that even, you know, the two 300 level undergraduate courses in computer science that are starting to deal with some of the linked data concepts. Um, we certainly can't take the same exact approach. We're dealing with graduate students who have, are coming from all sorts of backgrounds, right? Uh, they have a lot of different uh, uh, levels of expertise in various things. Um, uh, but I think we can look at the, the methods that are used to teach linked data skills in computer science and then try to apply those into our courses. You know, as you mentioned, we've got very limited, it seems like shrinking all the time, space in, a, in an LIS graduate program to handle the different things we need to do. Um, so, you know, thinking about the core concepts that need to take place in an information organization introduction course, and then thinking about how to impart some more technical skills in something like the metadata elective. Uh, so I'm teaching metadata. This is my second year teaching it at University of Tennessee. I am much indebted to uh, Jen and to Marsha Zhang <laughs> for learning how to teach this topic, but uh, I'm trying something new this year, and that has been, uh, you know, many educators are trying new things uh, in light of the stuff that's happened this year. Uh, but I've been doing the metadata course as a split uh, synchronous asynchronous course. And so the synchronous time together, we cover concepts, uh, we do our discussion kind of lecture time. And then asynchronous is a lab sequence that they go in and complete their lab every week and they learn, you know, I tell them these are the three skills that you're going to learn this week, validating XML, loading files into Oxygen. And so we kind of split between the concept background and then developing some functional skills. And so the hope is that at the end of the course, they've developed uh, through the lab time, they've practiced those skills and, and developed some tangible skills and through the course time, they've developed uh, the conceptual understanding and the ability to talk about the work and ask questions about the work. Um, and we're, you know, five, we're already five weeks into the semester. I think it's going well. The students seem to like it. Um, and that's helped me to kind of try to um, uh, find a, a different way to kind of balance the concepts and technical skills in the very, very limited space that we have, especially this semester with our courses all being shortened as well. So. Great. And I and I think you know the the we're going to see a, a closing gap between library science and data science, you know, as things go forward. If you if you'll indulge me in an analogy, you know, when I was in library school, the term digital library was just emerging, and no one knew what that meant. No one knew what the skills associated with becoming a digital librarian were. There was no agency for digital librarianship. There was no Digital Library Federation yet, or there was no part of the ALA or part of the LIS education. 
And then over time, as those things emerged, we stopped saying digital library, right? And just started saying library again. I feel like this is where we are with data science and machine learning right now, right? You know, it's its its its, it's, its own thing. Um, and we're trying to bridge the gap between it and library science. And that 20 years from now, we'll just be saying, you know, digital, or we'll, we'll just be saying data. You know, we won't be distinguishing data science from library science the way we, we are now because it's a burgeoning new field. Um, but that's why I put in the chat earlier, you know, this is the area that I think we're going to need more of. Um, it's certainly what OCLC is looking at, you know, ontologists, data engineers, information architects, uh, and not just the folks that are, are familiar with a particular domain around Mark and things like that. That, that's a good one. Um, I, I really like that uh, data engineer um, ontologists and uh, uh, information architects. And I think these uh, uh, features are, uh, are very important for our graduate students, but it is also difficult for, um, you know, for one student, you know, say if I'm in the uh, LIS program to have all these qualities in one person uh, that will be very challenging in the two year uh, program. So uh, that goes back to my uh, to uh, what you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, you said uh, um, th there is a um, paradigm shift from uh, records to entity. So, um, so I, I, it struck me as an educator because, you know, a lot of our information organization uh, course content has been focused on, has still, it are still focusing on records. And um, we only uh, cover the entity concept, you know, the, the description concept more in authority control uh, or in, uh, you know, in linked data, when, which is only covered in metadata course. So what, uh, in, in, in you and in Jeanette and Brian's um, uh, opinion, um, what would you think is the most, um, most compelling um, impact of this shift paradigm shift on, um, you know, I won't say next generation or on future librarian or future LIS uh, graduates because um, within two years they can't get everything into their, you know, into their brain. But what is the most compelling skills and knowledge they should have if to to um, be competent to ad adapt into this paradigm shift? I think we'll, we would need to have a whole second panel to address that. that one. <laughs> Let's start working on the next uh, one, but uh, you know, for me with teaching, it's it's been about you know, like you said, a, a lot of times information organization topics are taught focused on the record, uh, and then you know, metadata takes the form of statements that all live in a nice little compiled record, and they sit around, and we think of them as little rectangles, and yeah, you know. and so it's a different way of thinking about data entirely, uh, and this, you know. So dealing with right questions about uh, entities, about names versus concepts, um, and how those things relate to each other, things that we uh, probably didn't have to teach students about, you know, like 10 years ago, but are, are more important now, understanding the difference between those things that, a, you know, a label is not a concept, uh, is not an entity, uh, is some of this kind of conceptual stuff. Uh, you know, students are very resistant sometimes to having theory, but uh, this is an area where that helps, you know, so using some actual concept theory I've started to in some classes um, to kind of give them that different mindset, I think, to help to be able to approach these different environments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeanette and Andrew, do you have uh, any thoughts? Uh, well, I would like to hear your thoughts about this. So I would go back to something that I've been saying, I think, which is um, that I know people frequently don't like to learn the theory, but really that theory is what's key. And a lot of the key fundamental metadata and information organization and description practices still hold, whether or not you're talking about records or you're talking about entities. And so one thing is like really focusing on, on that core concept of 
you know, describe one thing at a time. Um, know what you're describing and describe that and know what is important for that one thing. Um, and so in some ways we are entering with entities an opportunity to really be true to that in a way that we haven't been able to be true to it um, in a MARC record, for example, or an XML record. So I think that really focusing on that sort of fundamental skill and, and, and mind frame is really helpful for developing a lot of these other skills. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think, you know, I think the, there are opportunities to, to, to teach practical application of this as well. So, you know, the, as you know, I started, I'm a system, I started my career as a systems librarian, right? I trained to be a rare book cataloger and became a systems librarian naturally. Um, and, and a lot of systems development was around um, systematizing sort of repetitive workflows, right? Re replacing the, the work that people were doing, you know, with, with systems. I think the change, the difference here with linked data is that it's it's looking at the the basic activities of of cataloging. You know, you have registration of holdings, you have copy cataloging, you have original cataloging, and I think the opportunity here is to shift that original cataloging work and the copy cataloging work into knowledge work, right? So I'll, I'll use an example from Project Passage um, that that has to do with what Jeanette was just saying too. I'm describing a poster for a concert. Right, and the typical cataloging method would be I'm going to describe the item in hand, right? And right away in a linked data environment, in an entity environment, the cataloger was saying, I can start to describe the event that actually happened and where it happened and the other events that happened in that place where this event happened. Suddenly you're well beyond um, describing just that item in hand and you're linking it to other knowledge, right? And I think that's the that is going to be the big shift for for what catalogers are doing um, to to use that capacity. It's going to be not yeah, you know, it might be more work, it might be different work. Um, hopefully, it's different work than sort of traditional um, traditional item description. Thank you. All your answers are very enlightening. Um, thank you very much. And we also have another question on the chat room. Um, a, from Paul uh, Walk, uh, DCMI is uh, committed to maintaining the com competency index for linked data as a resource. Do you have any suggestions for how we should go about maintaining, updating this over time and where we might find support for this effort? So my initial thought was like, uh, you know, to host a workshop, maybe semi-regularly or something, have, you know, practitioners, educators, people from industry, and during the workshop, think about how the uh, competency index might need to be updated, what new resources to add to it, uh, what changes might need to be made. It's definitely something I'll take a look at. I mean, I, your, Brian was talking about a lot of resources, some of which I was familiar with, but others that I wasn't. So I think, um, you know, putting, you know, as, as there's, as there are more people say at OCLC with their attention on linked data, um, you know, exposing them to these resources and then asking them to look at ways to improve them. I would also just say the program for cooperative cataloging is putting a lot more um, resources towards this as well and producing a lot of projects around it. Um, and they have a whole training committee. So I would talk with them also. All good suggestions. Thank you. Um, um, I think on the chat room, we have no more uh, new questions now. Uh, yeah, any, uh, do you have uh, questions for one another among your panelists? And uh, you're no, answering just, questions. It's a lot of fun uh, listening to Jeanette and Andrew and, and talking together and some really great questions uh, from the audience today. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we, we, uh, uh, we actually have two minutes left, so <laughs> we are right on time, uh, very uh, punctual. So thank you all, um, our, um, you know, our panelists, uh, you, your presentation was very, very insightful and offered a lot of good for thinking. So um, I want to thank you and, uh, well, I won't represent uh, anybody else, but as a moderator, I want to thank you for such a wonderful uh, 
uh, panel and uh, you know hopefully we'll be able to meet face to face uh, you know next year's Dublin Core Conference and uh, well uh, I guess we can't you know have plus I would like to have a big <laughs> plus for our panelists uh, yeah uh, thank you very much and I think we can conclude our panel now and thank you